Greetings. If you're listening to this message shortly after it's recording, then Shabbat Shalom to you. We're on the, um, I believe it is the 18th day of the 11th month. The 15th was Wednesday, so 16, 17, 18, right? The 15th was Wednesday, which is Tu Bishvat, Hamisha Asar Bishvat, which is the Jewish Arbor Day. And uh, you might want to look into the book of Jeremiah and see the play on words there regarding the almond tree, some, a project I can give you to study. Uh, the almond trees are the first ones that begin to blossom uh, as, the, uh, as a foreshadowing of the spring to come, put it that way. And speaking of the, uh, since I was speaking about the Hebrew calendar, let's go back into uh, the ancient uh, Hebrew history. The Israelites were a real headache to Moses. So God gave him two tablets. You probably heard me tell that story before. Today I want to talk about those two tablets as an enduring standard. The Decalogue, the ten words, the ten utterances, the ten matters, which are actually, of course, the ten commandments. They, they are an enduring standard. Let's go to the New Testament as we call it, to the book of Ephesians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, predominantly Gentile church. And in Ephesians 6, he speaks about the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. An enduring standard, I'm telling you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he quotes, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Oh, see how he talks about them? To the New Testament church in Ephesus? The first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and, and you may live long on the earth. I'd like to go back to Exodus 20. And there was a time when this would not be really much of a debatable proposition. Even if you looked up today the Ten Commandments in Wikipedia, you'd probably find that the Ten Commandments are basic to Judaism and Christianity. They are a basic part of Judeo-Christian civilization. Now, I realize that there were some Bible-believing Christians, we, we could call them, who believed nine of them were valid for the New Testament, and the fourth one had been somehow spiritualized uh, but at least you know, they would all agree on, the, on nine of them. But generally speaking, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition would have applied all 10 of them to contemporary life in various ways. And if you go through the history of the Western world, let's go to fairly recent history. Back in the 1920s, a, a very, as far as I know, a very powerful movie was produced called the Ten Commandments, and then it was remade in, in, in modern form in 1956. Uh, I believe Cecil B. DeMille did both of them, but the modern one uh, is one that's had a major impact. It's an iconic movie, <clears throat> and the Ten Commandment movie, which goes on, you know, we, we have a lot of fun with it because uh, we saw it one time in, in a beautiful place to see a movie. We were on Sunset Boulevard, and it was a, what did we call it, the Cinerama Dome? And when we lived in Southern California, occasionally we went there. And to see the Ten Commandments in that kind of setting was quite dramatic. But the audience was, was a, basically a religious audience, but they also were, were a fun-loving audience. So Cecil B. DeMille comes out in the beginning of the movie, and he says, this movie will, will, will take three hours and 42 minutes. And then he says, there will be an intermission, and people are applauding. You know, but th that was a long movie, but how did it end? It ended with, with, so they were written, so they shall be done. Now that was in the 1950s America. That was ba the basic culture of America. People thought you ought to do the Ten Commandments, whether or not they were living up to it, but it was part of the, the culture of that day, those happy days, you could say, of the 50s. Uh, so they were written, so they shall be done. Now in more recent years, uh, a, a liberal Jewish pundit Ted Koppel gave a speech in 1987 at the Duke University uh, commencement, and he talked about the Ten Commandments, and he said they were not the Ten Suggestions, and he spoke very eloquently about them, and you could look it up. 
Uh, and then in later years, uh, uh, a couple of Jews who are famous for their t radio talk shows, among other things, uh, wrote about the Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, Laura, Dr. Laura Schlesinger wrote a book about them. And then later in more recent years, Dennis Prager uh, wrote a book about them. He also has a very fine lecture series uh, that you can watch. Now, I don't agree with everything, particularly, I mean, I haven't seen everything, but I, dis I have certain disagreements with how he understands the, um, the third one. But uh, I, I still would certainly uh, recommend, uh, from what I've seen of his, of, of his talks, you know, something to, to look at. And again, you know, this is something that is very much is still a part of popular culture, although I would have to say it, it, their general acceptance and popularity as a standard a moral, uh, how should I put this, moral imperative has been to some degree diminished. And I think I know uh, why, and I'll, and I'll get to that after a while. Now, when I was a teenager, I was in a very exciting discussion group. And we had all kinds of beliefs there. And in those days, we were perfectly honest with what we believed. We didn't hide it. You know, now, I, I, well, I don't want to get into contemporary pol political life. I'll, I'll, I'll restrain myself. I'll just say back in the 60s, when I was a teenager, we were wide open about our views. And we had all kinds of people in that, in that group. And uh, one time we were meeting at the home of a liberal Jewish family and uh, the, the mother of, of the one of the, uh, of the uh, one young lady who was in the group began to in effect pontificate to the teenage audience that was there and he said to us she said to us as many a liberal Jew would say then and now she she said to us I'm not saying you have to believe in God but you have to believe in the Ten Commandments now what did she mean by that she meant that the Ten Commandments were a basic moral code, universally applicable, worth worth keeping. Now you could say, how could a an, an atheist uh, believe that? Well, I think the way an atheist would would keep the first couple of commandments is by not deifying an institution, a person, you know, not not making a god out of out of something human, and uh, the Sabbath uh, is honored by some secular people. Uh, in the sense that they do not work that day, they, they rejuvenate themselves, they do uh, educa educational and cultural activities or recreational activities within a certain, you know, within certain bounds that are more perhaps relaxing in, in, in connection with nature and so on. There are some uh, secular uh, Sabbath keepers, although I think they, you know, their number two may be diminishing in, in this age where, where people kind of very much line up in a partisan way, either very religious or very, you know, anti, anti-religious. But in any case, the idea of keeping the Ten Commandments back in the 60s, which was a very radical time, uh, a very revolutionary time, nevertheless, it was still pretty much standard. Uh, ac accepted that yes, this was a moral code. The, the Supreme Court of the United States has the Ten Commandments on the building of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., in our capital, and so on and on I could go. But as I also have said, in this day and time, I'm speaking in 2018, the Ten Commandments are not quite uh, as generally known uh, and as generally uh, accepted as a basic standard. But for those of us who, who believe in the Bible, for those of us who are, who are more uh, associated with our Judeo-Christian heritage, they are indeed an enduring standard. The Ten Commandments are in force. They've always been in force, for that matter. And if you could read the, you read the early parts of the Bible, you read the books of Genesis, the book of Genesis, you'll see, you know, that it, it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to commit adultery. And the Sabbath is found in the early, very early uh, verses of the Bible back there, the way the general, most Bibles are broken up in chapters. I'm beginning the second chapter of the Bible, and I, and I see it in the, in the second verse, uh, the, the Sabbath is mentioned. And then in the, in the story of Noah and the flood, the, the account of Noah and the flood, you see seven-day weeks talked about there, periods of seven days. So, as I said, the Ten Commandments have been there all along, and they're here now, and we're accountable uh, to keep the Ten Commandments. In, uh, in Exodus uh, 34, I mean, Exodus, uh, yes, 24, I'm sorry, in Exodus 24 and verse 12, normally the Ten Commandments in the Bible are called Aseret HaDevarim, the Ten Words, or the Ten Matters, in Rabbinic Hebrew, Aseret HaDibrot. 
So they, they, they're the Aseret Hadarim, the ten matters or the ten words. Uh, but in that sense, they are the basic matters, you know, the basic words upon which the, the entire law uh, is built. And they are commandments, as uh, Ted Koppel pointed out in that talk I referred to earlier. They're not the ten suggestions. Let's look at uh, Exodus 24:12. Then the Eternal said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. Now God wrote, you know, in, in specifically those ten commandments. Um, there are various verses on that. Um, let's go to Exodus uh, 28. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Exodus 34, <clears throat> I think I want in verse, um, verse 28, let's go to Exodus 34 and verse 28. So he was there with the eternal forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread and nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. But if you go back to verse 27, then the eternal said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and Israel. But I, I think you will find that actually... It was God who wrote who wrote on the tablets. In fact, my um, my Bible capitalizes the he here in verse twenty eight, and he he that Moses did write the, the, the many other things, but these ten were written by God, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten commandments, and um, we'll get to that uh, in just a moment. Um, there's a there's a a verse which says that they were written with the finger of God. I'd like to go to. Uh, Deuteronomy 10 and verse 4. Let's go to the beginning of Deuteronomy 10. Here we're talking about the second uh, giving of the law. Let's go first to, um, to Deuteronomy 9. Why don't you look up uh, where it says finger of God, written with the finger of God. Find that verse and let me know. I, uh, there is a verse where, uh, no, in, 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 uh, it's in Exodus and Deuteronomy where we find that the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. I want to go to Deuteronomy 9 and verse 9. But they are written with the finger of God. I'll, I'll read you that verse. But Deuteronomy 9 and verse 9. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Eternal made with you. Then I stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the, the Eternal delivered to me two tablets of stone written. I hear it is. I found it. Where you don't have to look it up. Written with the finger of God. This is Deuteronomy nine and verse ten. Written with the finger of God. So yes, Moses wrote a lot of material, but these ten commandments were written with the finger of God. Then the Eternal delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Eternal had spoken to you on the mountains from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And if you look back at that moment in Exodus 19 and 20, it was so dramatic, so powerful. God revealed himself in a very special way on Mount Sinai. It was obvious that here was a critical moment in the history of the human race where a particular people were given the Ten Commandments to preserve and to keep and then to uh, serve as an example to the rest of humankind. It, it, that kind of dramatic moment is unique in, 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 in world history, in biblical history. So you see the importance of the, of the Ten Commandments. Now, if you go back then to the 10th, uh, or go ahead to the 10th chapter, we see that Moses broke them. Uh, you know, there's a riddle. Uh, who, who in the Bible broke all the Ten Commandments at one time? Moses. Uh, but he, well, this was, it's not funny though. He, you know, he saw a terrible uh, atrocity going on. 
you know, terrible sin going on. And so he was so moved that he, so disgusted, you know, he broke the Ten Commandments uh, in terms of the actual tables of stone that he had. But then God restored them. And uh, then they were put into the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so we in, in chapter 10, then Moses discusses Deuteronomy is where he's discussing the history of, of that of the period in the wilderness, the giving of the law, their their sins, and then the, re the, the renewal of the Ten Commandments. And so in, in chapter 10, he says, At that time the Eternal said to me, You for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. This is Deuteronomy 10.2. And I will write on the tablets the, the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. All right, so he says, So I made an ark of acacia wood, you two tablets of stone like the first, and went up to the mountain, having the two ta tablets in my hand. And he wrote, God, and he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Eternal has spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Eternal gave them to me. Now, they were the tables of the covenant. In other words, the covenant that God made with the people of Israel, the Sinaitic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was based particularly on the Ten Commandments. Now, that was the what we you might call the, or what the Bible calls the Old Covenant. But what, hap, what is the New Covenant all about? It's about our internalizing those commandments. It's about our having the understanding of those commandments in a deeper way, a more profound way, and then also a more profound desire to obey. It's about changing our minds. You know, as, as Deuteronomy 5 says, I'll go there. Uh, when the Ten Commandments are repeated by Moses, he, uh, we see then in Deuteronomy 5.29, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me, and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. That's the problem. The problem is with the people of Israel. They, they were carnal. And the, you, in order to properly obey God, we need to be converted, have converted minds. That's what the new covenant is about. The New Testament, as it's called. And I want to go to Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. 31, 31. You ought to remember it. 3131 of Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, says the Eternal, when I will make a new covenant, Bricha Dasha, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Ikini uh, the Ethiki in the Greek, the new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Eternal. And then he goes on and talks about the new covenant. What does it involve? But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in, after those days, says the Eternal. And by the way, yes, he does make it with the house of Israel. And initially it was offered to, to the Jewish people who were the only Israelites around who knew who they were and whom the world recognized as such. But then it went to the entire world. Now when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem as the capital of, of his kingdom, the first nation converted in mass will be the Israelitish nation. And then from there, the rest of the world will, will come to be converted. We will have at first a triple alliance between Assyria, Egypt, and Israel. You can read about it in Isaiah 19. So in the, in the future, in the kingdom of God, in the world to come, when Jesus Christ returns, the first nation converted in mass will be the nation of Israel. However, uh, in the meantime, in these two millennia, however long it takes till Jesus Christ returns, we, we understand the church is universal, worldwide, and interethnic, and whoever uh, who, uh, God calls, you know, whoever he, uh, whomever he chooses, of uh, the various nations of the world, and then they become a spiritual Israel, they become spiritual Jews, you know, Galatians 6.16, Romans 2.28, 29, and so we have a, a, a spiritual Israel preparing the way for the second coming of Christ when the various nations will be converted, beginning with Israel. So right now, the Spirit of God is being made available uh, n not based on ethnicity. And for that matter, you know, even in the future, it won't be based on ethnicity. It just so happens that God is going to use the nation of Israel as an example, convert them first, and then convert all the others. He does want the whole world to be united in love and, you know, with one God, one uh, way of life, uh, spiritually speaking. Uh, the way of life based upon his word. That way the world will know freedom, peace, prosperity. 
uh, anyway, in verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Eternal. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the Ten Commandments will become internalized. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Eternal, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Eternal, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So you see, the new covenant involves not just being able to obey God, but also be, being forgiven for disobedience. That's a part of it as well, critically critical to it. And that, of course, that, that is a relationship to, uh, to God through Jesus Christ. So we do see the importance of the Ten Commandments and that they are a basis of both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And in fact, when Jesus Christ goes on the mount, you know, not Mount Sinai, but the mount in the land of Israel where he, he gives the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he's expounding on the Ten Commandments. He, he, he uh, in effect, is, is giving the spiritual intent of the Ten Commandments. And uh, as we see in Isaiah 42 and verse 21, he's fulfilling that prophecy. In Isaiah 42 and verse 21, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, as it's called, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you see really a fulfillment of Isaiah 42 and verse 21. The Eternal is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. So the full intent of the law is brought out uh, in uh, the teaching of Jesus Christ, the so-called Sermon on the Mount, you know, where, where Mount Sinai is then taken to a, a higher level, you, you could say. Now, if we, uh, let's, let's go back to Exodus 20 and take a look at it. He introduces it. I am the eternal, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So this applies to Israel, but we understand from a spiritual point of view, Egypt as a type of sin. We're in bondage to sin. You could look at, at Romans, the sixth chapter, and God frees us uh, from the the penalty of sin, which is ultimately eternal death. And then he goes on. So that's the introduction. Then we have these commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. And then how do we worship God? Not with graven images. You shall not uh, make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water but under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the eternal your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So if you continue to hate God, the, the penalty persists and, and evidently is cumulative. If you persist in these sins, the, the, you know, it, it gets worse and worse, uh, the, the, the repercussions. Uh, there's more one could say, but that's uh, at least a, a way to understand that. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So as long as we obey God, the blessings are there and they go on and on and on. They don't stop. They don't peter out. You shall not take the name of the eternal your God in vain, which would seem like a light thing, but it isn't to God. For the eternal will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's not a light matter, even though in this day, day and time it seems to be considered such. But it's not, it's not a light matter. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. By, in Exodus 16, Israel had revealed to them the Sabbath day, and it comes from week to week, so we, we remember it from week to week. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. By the way, if you, <laughs> let's put it another way, you would want other people not to want to uh, steal from you, not to lie to you. Uh, you'd want other people not, not to want to take your life, and you'd want your employee, your employer, if you're a worker, you'd, you'd certainly want your employer to give you one day off, at least one day off a week. You know, you wouldn't want to be uh, have a job where you don't get a, a full day off. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the eternal your God, and it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the eternal made the heaven and heavens and the earth. You know, going back to, as I said, to Genesis. Uh, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the eternal blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. I'll have more to say about that in a, in a little while. Honor your father and your mother. I read about that. The apostle Paul brought that up as the first commandment with promise. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the eternal your God is giving you. 
I've gone already that, wow. I can't believe it. You sh I, I thought, all right, you, sh you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear, for, for, bear false witness against your neighbor. And I'll just say the 17th commandment, or rather verse 17 has the 10th commandment, which mentions seven points, you shall not covet. That's the basic idea. Now, I, I, I see I'm short on time, so I'll say that Moses, before they entered the promised land, took the trouble to repeat these commandments again. And there he tells them, keep the Sabbath, because at that point, they had already been, been doing it. He tells them to observe it. And then he, but he also goes on to talk about the Sabbath as not only a symbol of creation, but a symbol of liberation. That we had, we Israel was slaves in Egypt, and they were liberated. And so the Sabbath is a liberating institution. And so it's important from that point of view. It also liberates us in the spiritual sense, because as we set aside the cares of the week, we can focus on the spiritual on the Sabbath. So Deuteronomy 5 repeats the Ten Commandments then in, in somewhat different form. Now, regarding the Sabbath, if you go to the New Testament, you'll find that in Matthew 12, we're, we're, we're talk, we're, it, Jesus is talking about how to keep the Sabbath. And in Mark 2, and in Mark 3, and in Luke 6, and in John 5, these are confrontations with the rabbinic Sabbath. Jesus did not break the Sabbath. He couldn't have and been sinless. He was sinless. But he did violate rabbinic traditions regarding the Sabbath, rabbinic law, because he was illustrating how to keep it. Why did he take so much trouble to illustrate how to keep it? Because he intended his people to continue to keep it, but in a new covenant way, not necessarily in the rabbinical form. Uh, but the Sabbath comes every week, so it's important to clarify uh, the, w w how to keep it. So he did in many parts of the New Testament. And, uh, you know, I could say more about that, but that is really the problem, perhaps, in this day and time, why the Ten Commandments have to some degree be, been de-emphasized. Uh, I think the reason that they've been de-emphasized is because at one time, among Christians, the Sunday was considered the Christian Sabbath, and it was very strictly observed. You ought to look at the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, and, and, and you, you would see there, and, and, or, if, or, if you grew, or if you're older, and grew up in some parts of, of the United States or in Scotland, certain areas, you know, where, where Sunday was very strictly observed. Back, in fact, recently, Poland, Poland just a, a few days ago, I think, passed a law that's making it more and more difficult to, to uh, shop on, on Sunday. This is in 2018. You know, so there was a time when Sunday was c considered, quote unquote, the Christian Sabbath, and by many very strictly observed. The problem is, in recent, in recent years, with this explosion of knowledge, people realize that really the Sabbath is the day we call it in English Saturday. And so rather than try to argue uh, for, for a Sunday Sabbath because their arguments uh, aren't strong enough, <laughs> so they decided to pretty much, I guess, discard th th that, the co Sabbath concept and spiritualize it. And so now nine of the Ten Commandments are still uh, supported, but evidently the fourth one um, is, is looked upon more as a spiritual matter, uh, as I said, because it, it, the Sunday arguments tended to, you know, to not be strong enough. This is a, a personal interpretation of what's happened. Uh, and I don't mean this in any disparaging kind of way. This is just a comment on, on, on 2018 and the, and the situation theologically that I, that I see. But I hope I've made the point that if you read the Bible from cover to cover, the Ten Commandments were, were there, and then they were codified, given to the nation of Israel in a very dramatic way, and then uh, repeated in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, covered and, 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 and restated all through the Bible, clarified and made uh, spiritually more powerful, more impactful in the New Testament. And then we can finish up by going to um, Luke 18. You can find this account in Matthew 19. And you can find this account in Mark 10. Maybe that's easy to remember because we're talking about the Ten Commandments. But I'll go to Luke 18 because of my background in Gematria. I'm being a bit of a mystic here. You know the Hebrew word chai, alive, chet yud. Uh, chet yud in numerically is 18. To life, to life, lechayim. So let's go to Luke 18. And let's go to verse 18. How about that? Luke 18, 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
So you you know what he what he did. He quoted several of the Ten Commandments, uh, and and um, in this passage. Um, and uh, then he then he said, "I've been doing that." Well, what do you think he meant when he quoted these commandments? Only these? You think that's what he meant? Now I only, you only have to keep these that I qu I'm quoting. He's quoting enough of them so the man gets the idea what you have to do. You have to live according to the Torah, according to you know to God's law. And so he said, I've been doing that. So then Jesus goes and says, you need to commit yourself to me. That's the part that's missing. Well, he, he couldn't do that because Jesus demanded of him that he, he get rid of his wealth and, and become a, an apostle. And he was not willing to do that. Now, Jesus doesn't ask that of us necessarily, but he does ask us to commit ourselves to him, to be Christian commandment keepers. And that's the point. In this day and time, if we want eternal life, which is really uh, what Luke 18 is about, you know, eternal life, Luke 8, 18, 18, if we want eternal life, we want to have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ and to follow his example and keep the commandments. And I want to go now to 1 John 5 and verse 3. <clears throat> 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God. Do we love God? For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, the culture in which we live may, may want us to think of them that way and may try to make them that way, but they are not that way, ultimately. It's like the story I like to tell uh, about the man carrying a heavy bundle, and people asked him, why are you carrying that heavy, bu heavy bundle? He opened it up, it was full of jewels. Then they began to understand. I want to go to Revelation 12 and verse 17. And the dragon, Satan, right? We read the rest of the book, we know that. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. We read the rest of the book, we know it's the church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are Christian commandment keepers in the generic sense. Yeah, I don't mean they have to be a member of a particular group, but I'm saying they are Christian commandment keepers. And the Ten Commandments are a part of their heritage. It's a part of our heritage. It's a part of Judeo-Christian civilization. I want to go now to Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints, Revelation 14, 12. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. People who have that relationship to God through Jesus Christ. They've accepted him as their personal savior, their Lord and master, their high priest and coming king. But they're also walking in his footsteps. They're doing what he did to the extent that, you know, they're, they're, that God enables them to do it. You know, he, they are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ kept, kept the Ten Commandments and so should we. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments are an enduring standard. Now, if you want to communicate with us, uh, we have a website, CCK153. We have a, uh, we are on Facebook. We also can be written to by the old-fashioned post system. We're at, uh, 50, the Church of Christian Commandment Keepers is at 52 Riley, R-A-R-I-L-E-Y, Riley Road, Box 153. Celebration Florida 34747. So you can get involved with us via the website, via Facebook, or, or uh, via post. And in any case, you can keep watching these messages, which I hope you will. All the best to you and yours.